Welcome back after tea and what we will do now is to do a session on think pair share which is one of the types of active learning strategies. So we are going to try a small experiment here in the sense that I have already done this session for the coordinators workshop in April and they have created the video of that workshop. So I am going to play the video of the workshop and pause it at appropriate times for some live interaction with you. Okay. So let me start with the video. I may do a little bit of fast forwarding of the video because uh, some of the uh, items in that video we have already seen in the morning session. So let us see how this works out. And of course, if there is a problem with the video and you know it fails for whatever reason, then I will just switch back to doing a live session altogether. Okay, let me skip all this introduction. So let me ask this first question. Okay. So when we talk about MOOCs, one of the things that come to mind and one of the things that we have been uh, propagating also is the fact that we should create uh, short videos, excellent videos and these are expert videos which then students can see and then we can use a flipped classroom model where students then come to class and discuss and so on and so forth. Right? So the first question we want to ask is that is it enough to create these excellent videos? Okay. So I'll talk about one experiment. So what happened in this experiment is that there were two videos, video lectures that were created. Okay. So all the correct things were done. The duration was correct, the topic was proper, all of that. And then it was the same content and the instructor and in one case the instructor spoke fluently, didn't refer to any notes, you know, made eye contact with the audience, all of that. And in the other case, the instructor spoke very haltingly, kept looking down, you know, kept hesitating and things like that. Okay? So what do we expect? In which video will more learning happen? The first one, right? So we expect that the first video is going to be much more effective than the next, the disfluent one. Okay, so interestingly, it turns out that there is no difference in the amount of learning that happened to students in terms of what they were able to score in the exam. Okay, can you guess why? Because the method was same. Because the method was different, no? The way they, the one, okay, the method of instruction was the same. The mode of instruction or the, the quality of instruction was different. Yeah, what else? What else could be a reason? Hmm? Sorry? Students were not much interested in either of the videos, so it didn't matter really whether you did a great video or not. <laughs> okay. Lack then, of huh? Lack, of interaction. Lack of interaction is one. Okay. Huh? They are only listening. Okay. Okay, let me ask a slightly different question. So just think of the subject in which you are really the expert. Okay. What made you an expert in that subject? What is it that you did? to become an expert in that subject? Tutorials. Tutorials, little more, yeah. To, to create the interest. To create the interest. Self-learning. Self-learning. So essentially the point is it's not really how well the instructor is able to deliver. If you are to become an expert, what the key is the practice, right? How much practice? So why did the students who did well do well? They did well because they practiced. They did the problems, okay? They went home and worked, all of that. Okay, so that's the key point. So what we are saying is, improving the fluency of lectures does not necessarily imply that better learning is going to happen. So we need to focus on identifying what does lead to better learning. Okay, so then let's ask the other question. When we go from MOOCs to blended MOOCs, okay. So now, say okay, I have excellent videos and like many of you said, interaction is the thing that is missing if I just look at a video, right. So plus interaction with a local instructor. Is that good enough? What do you think? Students are interacting with the local instructor. It's not like the MOOC instructor in interacting with local instructors. Local instructor interacting with students locally. Is that good enough? Yes. Yes? Okay, it's better. Okay, that's a good answer. It's better. 
Okay, but it still does not cut it. Yeah, somebody wanted to say something there. Yeah. Same point comes, student learn by self-learning, but the local instructor teaches in local language, but the contents are excellent. So student take both, local instructor instruction okay. and the contents from excellent video. Okay. So I think that is a good one. Okay, so this is a good one, but still, I am going to say that in most cases, the answer is still no. Okay, Because once again, this works for students who are self-motivated, students who are interested. All of those parameters have to be met. Okay, why? Because if you look at the average student who is kind of medium interested in the subject, who is there because, okay, you know, it's there in the curriculum, I am being forced to sit here, let me listen to this guy, somehow I have to pass the course. A lot of people are in that category, okay. So for that category of students, basic problem is students don't pay utmost attention, right. Even right now, I am thinking that everybody is paying attention to me. I doubt if more than 50% are really paying attention to me, right. So we expect like some people are fiddling with their mobiles, I can already see there, some of them are having their laptops doing something else. I wonder are they taking notes or are they checking their email? So, so many things are there, right? So students don't pay utmost attention, however well we interact or we attempt to interact with them. Second thing is, students think that they know or understand because they are able to follow the lecture. This is a very big one, okay? Because for most good instructors, we are great lecturers. So when the student is sitting there and I am working out the example, the student is able to follow because the clarity is in my mind, not in the student's mind. Okay? It's only later they realize that they have not really understood the topic. Okay? So something has to be done to make that happen. Okay? Then as an interaction, when we say that look, interactivity is the main thing that's going to make um, my students learn, it's difficult to ensure that all the students in the class participate actively. Even if you see now, Okay, so there will be a person here, a person there, a person there who answers, who responds to me. It's hard to ensure that the people who are shy somewhere here, somewhere there, they also participate. Okay, so that is a key difficulty. Okay, students with high motivation, high achievement levels, loud voice, they drive the pace, right? And students who are a little diffident, they get left behind. Okay. And also students have a barrier responding to the instructor directly, you know. So you always feel that, look, maybe my question is too stupid, I should not ask this question. How many of us feel that? No, we feel that all the time. So these are the barriers that come in the way of even an interactive class. So what we are doing right now is a typical interactive class. And even in such a class, these barriers come in the way. You don't ensure that, okay, every student who is there is engaged with the content, no student is getting distracted yes question sir i think inst uh, interaction should be must because uh, if interaction is not uh, in any lecture then queries remain always queries the, what about queries That's How correct. so okay let me clarify i'm not saying interaction is not required you told in, in first in most cases it's no it's How not it is good enough but I think so 100% interaction should be must. Then uh, what about queries? Queries remains always queries. That's fine. I am not saying no to interaction. You have not got the point. Okay. The, what I am saying is you need something more than interaction. Okay. Fine, sir. That's what I am saying. Okay. Interaction is definitely required. Okay. What we need is something more. So what is that more? That's what we are trying to get to. Okay. So queries have to be answered. but. Only students with high motivation even speak up. So there may be, take this particular audience itself. You know, there may be a question in somebody's mind over there. That person may or may not have asked the query. So there needs to be a mechanism where which everybody's queries can come. That is the point I'm trying to make. Okay. Okay. So moving on. So one solution for this problem is what is called active learning. You know, making an active learning strategy in the classroom. Okay. So the active learning, the basic definition is that students are going to engage with the content by writing, reflecting, thinking. See, what we realize that the only way I become an expert at something is by practicing that thing. I don't become an expert at something by listening to somebody. So I need to practice that thing. So, And what we want to do in active learning is get students to do that practice right there. Okay, So that's the key point. So there are many informal strategies. See, many of us do this. I mean, it's not like something very uh, revolutionary. Many of us do this in our class. We make small groups and things like that. 
So the only thing that we say in order for something to qualify as an active learning strategy is that we have to carefully design these activities. They should be explicitly based on theories of learning. There should be some theoretical basis to saying, okay, why I'm creating the activity in this manner. Otherwise, as teachers, we always have a lot of guesses in our mind, right? We feel that, okay, this is not happening, let me try that. And we feel that that will work. So those don't qualify as formal active learning strategies, okay? So there has to be some theoretical basis and they have to be evaluated repeatedly through empirical research. That's what is called active learning. I'm going to pause the video here because this part of it where we talked about gains from active learning we've already seen in the morning session. So let me go a little bit ahead and come to the activity in the video itself. So this time to do something now. So consider a large class. This is a problem that I'm posing, okay? Consider a large class, okay? Maybe an auditorium like this in which a class is going on. And imagine that I'm going on for 90 minutes, which is what my duration is, right? One and a half an hours, okay? And what you have to do is predict the number of students. Consider that you are students, okay? And you have to predict how many people in this auditorium are going to be listening to this fellow for 90 minutes, okay? That's your job, okay? So what you want to do is, you want to plot what is the percentage of engagement, what is the percentage that of the audience that is going to listen to me as time progresses, okay? So you all have your notebooks, try to draw this graph, okay? Draw a graph of engagement versus time, okay? That's the goal. So imagine a class like this, in which maybe I am the instructor or maybe you are the instructor, Imagine students sitting there and try to predict how is the student's engagement or students paying attention to the instructor going to vary as the class progresses. So do this on your own. We are not yet ready to talk to each other. I will give you time to talk to your neighbor. So first some graph of yours, your own has to be drawn. I have paused the video at this point and you have to do this activity yourself think and predict the percentage of students who may be showing engaged behavior with the content. Okay, so assuming that many of you have drawn some graph of your own, let me move on to the next slide. So what we need to do is with a pair examine each other's graphs. Okay, so you may have drawn a graph which is like this and somebody else may have drawn a graph which is like that and talk to each other about why that graph came like that. And together, come up with two techniques that can be used to convert the graph into something that looks like this, okay? So something where the engagement increases and stays at a high level almost throughout, okay? So this, you will get about five minutes to do this. Okay, so now is the time for you to talk to your neighbor and identify techniques which will get the graph to something that looks like what is shown on the slide. Okay? So I see that in many centers people are still sitting quietly staring at the slides. So staring at the slides is not the solution. Solution is now to talk to your neighbor and find out what is it that you will do in your class so that students are having a engagement at this level. Okay, so assuming that you have now talked to each other and come up with some technique to make the engagement stay like this, let me go on to the next phase where as a class in your entire center, create a list of techniques that can be useful. So what I would request is that the coordinator can send one technique from your center through the AVU chat. For example, Often people write the technique as, you know, I will tell a joke. So a joke may actually help to get the engagement up momentarily. But what you want is to identify techniques which will get up the engagement on a sustained basis. Some answers that are coming, as they are coming, I will just keep on reading. So somebody is saying quiz, somebody is saying showing video clips, pointing to a particular middle or last row student in the class, active learning by taking a quiz. So quiz seems to be the most favorable way. Somebody is saying that playing a role, that's a good one. Okay, group activities, group discussion, 
interactive sessions, small GD session, role play, give live examples with questions, brainstorming method, giving some practical examples, asking questions, real time examples. Okay. So, there is a lot of people who are saying that I will do an example, many are saying that I will do a quiz or give a puzzle, many are saying that I will have a group discussion. So, all these three are excellent ways, you know, there is somebody also who is saying that I will give an example with an analogy, somebody is saying I will do polling. So, now that you are coming up with these strategies, these strategies that you are suggesting to me as the response for the share phase, okay, these strategies that you are coming up with that are most likely to succeed, these are the strategies that constitute active learning. Okay, so, uh, following up from the previous session where you asked for examples of what can be done for active learning in the classroom, you can do these strategies that you have been, you are now sending to me through the chat window. These are the strategies that you can use. So, now let us ask this question. I think we can stop sending the responses through the AVU chat. Okay, there are, I have got now sufficient responses and that the key idea was to simply illustrate what are the difficult different type of answers that come from each center. Okay, so, we do not want to wait for all the 270 responses to come in. So, we will move on. The question now is, in this session we are going to talk about one particular type of activity which is called think pair share. Okay. So, what is think pair share? Think pair share is what we have just illustrated. So, now we have seen three instances of think pair share. One instance we saw in the beginning where we talked about various teaching scenarios and you came up with reasons for why the teaching scenarios are improving. Another reason we saw towards the end of the last session where again you talked about ways to handle students buy in into the lecture and just now we have also seen one technique which, which was the example of increasing engagement in the class. Okay. So, that is the think pair share. What is the exact definition we will talk about in the next uh, slide. Okay. So, why do we want to use think pair share in blended MOOCs? So, now what we are going to do is that we are going to be teaching CS 101 through so many mechanisms, right. So, the interesting thing here is that the well known challenges to teaching and learning in large classes also apply to MOOCs and blended MOOCs. Okay. It is more easy for students to tune out and get distracted, right. As we can see even in this synchronous remote classroom mo mode, I really have no control over what you are doing at the center. So, it is possible that you know, even if 50 percent of you are tuned out, there really is nothing that I can do sitting over here other than keep on exhorting that please work, please work, right. So, that is why active learning techniques that engage the entire class, not just the interested people, but the entire class, those techniques are required. Okay. And think per share is a relatively easy way to achieve the benefits of small group cooperative learning during the synchronous sessions in a blended MOOC. And you can easily get feedback that can be acted upon. So, what exactly is think pair share? So, think pair share is a collaborative active learning strategy in which students work on a problem posed by the instructor. Okay. So, for example, the problem that was most recently posed to you was to identify what is the engagement pattern in a large class. So, first you work on the problem individually. So, the individual work is important because you want every student to commit to some answer. Then you work in pairs, so that two students can share their understanding and if there are misconceptions, they can clear the misconceptions. And finally, we work together with the entire class. So, what happens in each of these phases? So, in the think phase, the teacher asks a specific question about the topic. So, students think about the question and come up with their own answer to that question. So, so far we have seen questions which are not subject specific, we have seen questions from CS 1, uh, we are yet to see questions from uh, computer programming, we will see that in a while. Then in the pair phase, the teacher asks another question related to the previous one 
that is suitable to deepen the understanding. So, this is what we just did, you know, first you had to draw a graph, each of you had to draw a graph and then the requirement was that you talk to your neighbor and come up with a strategy which will get a graph of the type that was shown where the graph was at 80 percent level, right. So, that is the pair phase where they share their thinking with each other and proceed with the task and finally, the students share their thinking with the entire class, ok. So, the teacher now moderates the discussion and highlights important points. So, this is the basic structure of a think pair share activity. It is a very powerful active learning technique to ensure that your entire class is engaged and especially useful for a course like computer programming where there is problem solving and where there is uh, other. Uh, so, what are the benefits? So, TPS works because students are actively engaged. So, these are benefits of any active learning strategy because students are actively engaged, ok. Second reason is students learn from each other, ok. So, this is a very important thing which happens anyway among students when they are learning just before the exams, ok. And the third big reason is that students can tackle large and ill structured problems and develop the ability to consider multiple points of use. So, these are three big advantages of TPS. And then there are other advantages which are true for many active learning techniques like it makes the class interactive, students realize that even others are struggling, okay, it builds a friendly yet academic atmosphere and it includes all the other students in the teaching learning process. So, TPS in this course, right. So, why should you care? So, what, have, what happens is that the MOOC will actually have TPS activities to be carried out in the when you are doing the local instructor phase, ok. So, your students learning depends upon how well you execute the TPS. So, what we will do is that right now we will see one example of a TPS activity and then we will write one activity of our own, ok. Here is an activity which is from CS 101, ok. It says write a program to find the smallest and largest element in a given array. So, this is then we say that in the think phase what we ask the student to do is write the pseudo code individually. In the pair phase we ask the students to write the C++ code with a partner ok. And in the share phase we ask the student to compare their program with the demo program that I as the instructor of this course had created. So, our question right now is to say why is this a good TPS activity, ok. Why is it a good idea to ask the students to do think pair share in this manner, ok. So, there are some centers which have taken the initiative and are sending me answers. So, I appreciate that. So, this is good for students to understand the solution of the problem with different ways. It is a good answer. So, please go ahead with uh, sending answers via the chat. Students share their ideas. Yeah, so let, so what I would suggest is that uh, as you are sending answers in the chat, if you, if you find that I have already read out your answer as coming from some other center, then do not send. So, that we can see how many answers are there to get multiple solutions. Students will start thinking and also learning involvement of each student. We can select a solution from a set. Interaction will be increased, understanding all the dimensions of the problem. Good for student to understand the ideas. Probable multiple ways of solving the problem. Weak student can get benefit. Enhance an analytical thinking, improves the depth of the solution, involves everyone, can get multiple solutions, poor students can also participate, ok. So, lot of centers are improves thinking in the entire class, students engagement in the classroom, ok. So, I think we can stop with uh, sending responses through the chat window, ok. And moving on, so what we find is many of you are saying that multiple solutions are possible which is a big plus point and many of you are saying that all the students are engaged which is another big plus point, ok. So, I would like you to distinguish between here is one the advantage of think pair share itself as an activity. So, many of the answers that people are sending are, have to do with think pair share itself and nothing to do really with this question about the array, ok. So, think pair share itself has the ability to get students to be interested and so on. So, the, the 
question that I'm asking here is why is this array question a good question? Let us try to examine what is there in this question that makes it a good question. Okay? Because this is the way you will be writing think pair share questions of your own. Okay, so let us look at this question. What happens? What do we see in the think phase? Okay. So one thing that you can observe about the think phase is that this writing the pseudocode individually for a program to find the smallest and largest element of the array is possible to do for every student. So even if the student did not come for the previous class, we are not asking them to write, do something very hard here. We are asking them to do something very simple and something which can be attempted by every student. Right? So if you look at all the think pair share activities that we have encountered so far, right, including in the previous session, what we will find is that in the think phase, the question is so small and reasonably simple that every student can attempt that question. That is the property of the think phase question. So even if the student has missed the previous class, even if the student does not know how to do C++ programming, this question will ensure that all of them are able to do this question. Okay? So that is why this think question is a good question for the topic of arrays. The next question, if you look at the pair phase now, the pair phase is also a good one because it builds on what they have done in the think phase. It says that okay, in the think phase you write the pseudocode. Now in the pair phase you write the C++ code with a partner. Okay? So some center has already pointed out that the timing is also an important thing, that the timing is adequate. Right? You are giving them 5 minutes to think about the pseudocode and then another 10 minutes to write the C++ code. Okay? So that is again a very important point that the timing is kept suitable for the type of question that we are asking. So the pair phase activity continues to build on what they have written in the think phase. So in the think phase they wrote the pseudocode and now we simply say that take your own pseudocode and write the C++ code as part of the pair phase. And then if you look at the share phase, the share phase is also a good example because the share phase invites everybody to check their answer with the shown answer. So the moment you say compare your answer with the instructor's answer, what happens is a lot of discussion is created. Okay. A lot of students will say that okay, you know, I have used the for loop, you have used the while loop, is it okay to use a while loop versus a for loop and so on and so forth. So this action of comparison with the given program helps the student to see okay, where my program is different, is my program better. So all of those type of queries arise and then multiple solutions come up where one set of students may have implemented it in one way, another set of students have implemented it in another way. Okay. So that is why if we look at this TPS example that is given here, the think phase, the pair phase and the share phase questions are good questions because, let me summarize again, first the think phase question is attemptable by all the students. Second, the pair phase question builds upon what work they have done in the think phase. Okay. So it just simply builds upon, take the pseudocode that you have written and now write the C++ code. And third, the share phase question has an incentive for all the students to participate because they are comparing their own answer with the instructor's answer. Okay. So this is one reason why this is a good TPS activity and the timing of the activities has been set up also appropriately. So what we will do now is that we will write a question yourself. Okay? So suppose you want to create a TPS activity that should lead students towards this goal. Okay? Write a program to manage the contacts data on your phone. What will you specify as the actions to be done in each phase of the TPS activity? So I will give you about 5 minutes to do this action in your respective centers. And the coordinators can themselves coordinate this activity in the center 
because this is the same activity which we carried out in the coordinators workshop. So I see that in some of the centers there are some people who are actually working on this activity. I also see some people who are just sitting waiting for the lecture to proceed and there are others who are completely off task who seem to be talking and you know chatting about something else. Now while there is nothing that I can do to enforce that everybody works on this activity, one thing that I can do is that post uh, assignment on this which I have done on Moodle and uh, I will just talk about the assignment in a way. There are some enthusiastic centers which are sending their answers through the chat. Ask them to write pseudocode, some program, compare with other students and so on. So what I am going to do is I am not going to really discuss the various activities that you have written for this particular question. So write a program to manage the contacts data on a phone. I am just going to simply talk about some possible ways in which you can do that. So some possible ways in which you can do this. One thing is in the think phase, so remember that the think phase has to be simple. Okay? So one thing to make this simple is that in the think phase we can simply ask them you know, what can be the maximum number of contacts or we can ask them what do you think is going to be the data structure that is going to be used for the contact. So yeah, so now I am seeing a lot of good responses on the chat, right? finalize the data structures and methods to be used. And then in the pair phase we can say that you write the pseudocode for the methods to be used for this contact data. And in the share phase, once again, you share your uh, program structure with that of the instructor or with that of other pairs. So I will just wait another one minute to see some of the responses on chat. So some uh, colleges have also sent how much time they are going to give for each of the phases. I appreciate that, that you have said that 10 minutes for the think phase another 10 minutes for the pair phase. So there are a lot of people who are putting in serious effort in order to come up with this think pair share activity. Data structure will be used for the task seems to be the most common response across all the centers. Manage the list based on different domains, first name, second name. So there are a lot of such questions possible. So the point I am trying to make here by asking you to send the responses through the chat window. Actually what you could do is you could also look at it at your own centers also. Later on you can look at the chat window at your center to see how many different responses have come for this question. Okay. So the point I am trying to illustrate here is that such a question does not have a single think pair share activity. So most of the answers that people have sent are valid think pair share activities. Okay. So you can choose the activity that you want to give in your class depending upon what exactly do you want to focus on. Do you want to focus on the data structure or do you want to focus on the logic or do you want to focus on the actual coding. So depending upon what you want to focus on, you can give your own think pair share question can be created for this particular activity. So I'll move on now. Okay, here are, here is the activity that I gave in my class, which was saying that think how you will store the information and write the C++ class declarations for the data structure. The pair phase, I had them discuss with their neighbors and agree on the class declaration and together write the code for the method. So this, this exact think pair share activity was in fact one of the answers which some center has sent. Okay, and in the share phase, it was participate in the discussion of your solution and other solutions. So this was one example of TPS in CS101. So let me do one more example of a conceptual kind. So now here, the idea is the, the sorting of an array which I talked about earlier. So where you say that consider an unsorted array of n elements and in the think phase, you simply ask them to write the pseudo code for sorting the array. Okay. In the pair phase, 
you ask them to discuss their answer with the neighbor and do a pros and cons analysis. So somebody may say, okay, my algorithm will work better if the array is already in a certain form. Okay? And in the share phase, you get the students to participate in a discussion of their solution and other solutions. Okay? So this TPS activity, as I already said in the previous session, this activity led to a discussion of various sorting algorithms. So, in a one hour class, so there was about 20 minutes of this TPS activity, followed by another 20 minutes of discussion of the various sorting algorithms. Okay, so, in about an hour's class, the students were able to grasp nearly four different sorting algorithms, which otherwise would have taken more than two classes to cover in the traditional lecturing mechanism. Okay. So, for those of you asked for uh, examples of active learning and examples of think pair share in uh, computer programming, here are some two, three examples that we have seen. Okay, let me show you one more example. So, this example is about writing the details of a particular program. Okay. So, what we are saying is, so in this case, this is specific to one programming language called Scratch that I had used. But let us ignore the problem as such. But if we look at the activities, we say that okay, in the think phase, the students have to write the pseudo code. In the pair phase, the students have to write the code for the interface for the details. And in the share phase, the they have to compare their answer with the instructor's answer. Okay. So, once again for detailing, this is a very good mechanism of detailing and coming up with multiple answers. Okay. So, now some of us may have this question that does this actually work? I showed examples of active learning strategies working and references from literature. So, what we did was we actually did these measurements in the computer programming course that I taught. Okay. And uh, we found that there is a lot of gain that actually happened for the students. So, we measured a total of 13 such activities and we performed an experiment to measure the learning. Okay. We, we found that 83 percent of the students on an average are mostly or fully engaged. So, 83 percent in a class of 250 students is a fairly big deal in getting all the students to be engaged and not having the backbenchers to completely tune out and do other things. The students self perception of the engagement matched our measurements also. When we do the experiment for the learning to see that okay engagement is fine, students are paying more attention in the class, but does think pair share actually help them to learn better. Okay, so, we had a two group experiment, in one group we did the think pair share, in one group we did not do the think pair share. And we found that the experimental group which had the TPS activity performed significantly better than the control group which learned the same concept from an interactive lecture. Okay. So, this is the reason why we believe that think pair share is a good technique for us to use in a course on computer programming. Okay. And you can see this uh, if you want more details of these papers, if you go to my a website, if you just Google Sridhar Iyer IIT Bombay, it will take you to my website and from my web page you can download these papers to look at. So, let me do two things now. One is I will summarize the think pair share setup guidelines and the second is we will do an assignment okay, where you write your own TPS activity. So, there are three points to keep in mind. One is to ensure that there is a clear deliverable for each phase. You know? So, we do not want to write a TPS question where we simply say think about the use of something. So, if we give a vague question, then the student does not know exactly what is to be done. So, each phase there has to be a clear deliverable where they know what is expected as an outcome. The second idea is to ensure that the phases are logically connected, they should use the output of one phase in the next phase. And the third point is that we should ensure that there is sufficient time for each phase. If we give too little time, the students will get frustrated. If we give too much time, then the students will get bored. Okay. 
So typically while executing think pair share, we have to move on when 80% of the class has finished. So in fact, if you notice, while you were submitting responses over the chat, I, after 80% of the centers have responded, I said, okay, we can stop with sending responses on the chat and we can move on, okay. So now what we will do is, having seen three, four examples of uh, TPS in uh, CS 101, so here is the assignment. So what we have done is we have created a think pair share activity constructor. So if you just follow through these steps, you will be able to create your own think pair share activity. What I want you to get right now is simply to understand what is it that is required in the next one hour when you do the assignment. Okay? So this assignment says it gives you examples from CS 101 where you can write the various uh, think pair share activities. Okay? So you write your think question here, you write your pair question here and for each phase there is an example and there are some guidelines. Then when you go on to the next page, there is an optional activity of talking to your neighbor and refining your activity. I would recommend that you do this in the lab and part 3 is what you will do in your own class. And the third page actually has lot of examples for different, different goals. So if your goal is conceptual understanding, here is an example of how to do think pair share in computer programming. If your goal is that students should be able to predict the output of a program, here is an example of what they should do, okay. So let me quickly summarize what this assignment is about. The assignment is about downloading this think pair share activity constructor and following all the instructions in it systematically, okay. So in the, what it will do is it will help you to create your own think pair share activity. So in the first part, you will write the think phase question. So there are, there are examples for you to look at and there are guidelines for you to follow. And in that box, you can write your own think phase question. Then in the pair phase, similarly, you will write the pair phase question. And in the share phase, you will write the share phase question. So that is the first part of the assignment, which you will carry out over the next uh, 20 minutes, okay. After you do that, what you will do is, you will discuss your answers with your colleague, with any colleague in the, in your center and take that colleague's input to refine your own activity, okay. So that is also one action that can happen during the assignment itself. So this is the lab activity that we are going to do. And on the last page, what I have given for you to look at are a lot of examples from CS101. So what you are required to do is from now, which is 12 o'clock till lunch time, you create your own think pair share question for the CS 101 for a topic of your choice. I am not mandating any particular topic. So you can choose any topic that you feel that will be useful for you to create a think pair share activity and by the end of uh, one hour. So before you go for lunch, upload your responses as the response to the assignment submission on Moodle. So the resource has been uploaded on Moodle. The resource has also been uploaded on AVU. So you can download it through either of the two uh, mechanisms and fill in the sections where you have to write the think phase question and the pair phase question and the share phase question and see if there is some uh, refinement of the question that you can do and then upload it back on Moodle as your response to the assignment. Okay. So please carry on with the assignment.